Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Kyle Report wherever you get your podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. If you want to find us on YouTube, go to Empire Media, A-M-P-I-R-E. Folks, they're only they're one and two, and I know you're frustrated, and I feel your pain, and I appreciate you sticking with the show despite the early struggles. I will say it is early. It's not time to overreact. They can turn this around with one win, but they need to win. We've heard that for many, many years. But I do feel your frustration. You want to see more progress. So do I. You want to see more wins? Yeah, that's that has to start happening. You can't just keep relying on saying that they're young. I mean, they're they're young in some areas, but they're not so young that they can't win some of these games by any means. So I think you they've got to show some real progress so that you folks can believe in what you're hearing and seeing. But Having said all that, I wanted to bring on former Washington tight end Logan Paulson so we can dive into some of the early season issues, like the offense. How much of the play calling needs to change, or what do they need to do to improve there? What about the offensive line? What about Brian Robinson's impact if and when for whenever he returns? And he will return, and probably soon. Whenever he returns, what's the impact? What is the trickle down? What about the defense? What can they? How can they build off a better showing against the Eagles? Listen, they gave up all those explosive plays, but 24 points, given the situation, all those explosive plays and the red zone work, that was a an effort where they could have won the game. And I think the one key, the one big difference between last week and the Lions game is against the Lions, those big plays were a result of bad bus, bad car, bad assignment or, or missed assignments, et cetera. The big plays last week were one guy was one guy making a great play over a guy who was in position to make it, who was in good position. And, you know, that that stuff happens. But there weren't as many busts. There was one or two busts, one of which was Dallas Goddard's touchdown. But the point is, it was a better effort from the defense. Now, they have to build on it. For this team to get going, they're going to need that defense to play better. And it's funny because two weeks ago, you would have said that, well, the offense is going to carry him. Not the case right now. That offense is struggling. I get into that with Logan, and we'll tr- I'll turn to that in about two minutes. So give me another minute or two before we get to there. And I just wanted to go over a couple of things from Wednesday. First of all, a couple of offensive linemen missing in practice or missing from practice. They, they were out there, um, but just not able to practice, one of which was left tackle Charles Leno. But he's, he's got a sore shoulder, but he is expected to be okay. Ron Rivera said it was really just a day to help him, let, let him rest his shoulder, that he's fine. Center Wes Schweitzer was not on the field because he's in the concussion protocol. Not a good sign. So newly signed Nick Martin, who was just brought in um, a week or a week or two ago, he'll be he was working with the starters today. So if if Schweitzer can't go, and it seems like it's certainly trending that way, then it would be Nick Martin, who at least is a veteran experienced center. That's a good thing. Sm- considered a smart player, which is which is good because. The line calls are huge for any center and especially in this offense. And then also facing that Dallas defense, which likes to show you a lot of looks, especially with with Micah Parsons. So that's what that's catching you up there. As far as Robinson, and I want to get a lump Ryan Robinson and Chase Young together because both are eligible to come up to return next week. I think what Ron Rivera was asked about Ryan Robinson today, he said there's no timetable, but the encouraging thing for them is every time they kind of put that marker in front of him to achieve, he always does it and he keeps going forward. That's obviously a very good sign. So it wouldn't shock me at all if if he's back, if not next week, then the week after. As for Chase Young, he looks really good as well. Both he and Robinson have been working on the side field, doing all the same stuff, a lot of of agility work and just a lot of sled work, tying the sled around your waist, pulling the weights. Young has been in a good mood when I've seen him in the locker room, that's a good sign too, although he's usually in a pretty good mood, but I think, I think there's, I think there's very much optimism that young could return. Listen again, he's eligible to come off the list list next week would not surprise me at all. If he is back out there for week five, that would be a big boost to this defense, but we'll see next week. Anyway, there you go. You want to hear from Logan Paulson. I want to share that with you. So let's get to my conversation with former Washington tight end, Logan Paulson. And by the way, you can check out Paulson as well as Craig Hoffman with on their Take Command podcast. Very informative one. If you like Logan, you'll like listening to that as well. 
and he'll tell you at the end where else you can follow him, et cetera. So let's get to my conversation with Logan Paulson. Logan, there's a lot to dig into, especially <laughs> on offense. And there's some things on defense that can they build on that? And then what are the concerns against Dallas? But I want to start on the offense. That's where, you know, you made your money. And so let's start there. And obviously, protection issues were, were kind of a big deal the other day. Sure. So when you go back and watch that game and for this team moving forward, first of all, what was the biggest issue? Was it as simply as guys just getting beat up front? And then what can be fixed going forward? So let's start with what did you see as the biggest issues? And, and not just last week, but it's been two weeks now, the biggest issues in protection. Yeah, so we went, Craig and I, on the Take Command podcast, we went over every single sack. And so we gave a very detailed breakdown of that. So if you want to hear like every single one and what we yeah, think. Don't like, want to hear check every one, out. but in general, yeah, yeah. yeah, go listen to that podcast. Hey, thank you. Go ahead. So in general, what I'd say is that like when you look at all nine, it's – Yes, the O-line's given up a lot of pressure, but also, like, how do you help that group? I think we all kind of understand that they're not, you know, they're not the Philadelphia Eagles offensive line. They're not the best offensive line in the NFL. They are a good group. They're a solid group. They're elevated by coaching. They're elevated by scheme a little bit. Um, and so they, they were giving up pressure. And so I think there's a couple of things. One, I think Carson in certain situations was holding the ball too long. And some of that is the route concepts covered. Some of that, the back gets kind of picked up or he gets chipped going out into the route and he can't get the ball out to the back quick enough. Um, but, and I also think some of it's play calling, right? I wish I could say it's this one definitive thing. Like, right. yes, the offensive line was getting beat quickly, right? I think, you know, there was one play that comes to mind where they're in 12 personnel. There's two tight ends in the game. They're to the left, the receiver to the right this team has a very, very strong tendency to run play pass on a first down in that situation, in that down and distance, in that section of the field. And so I felt like Fletcher Cox, when he saw that, he was like, I'm going to rush the pass here. Like, I'm just going to see what happens. And then that leads to pressure. You don't get any of like the benefit of the play action pass kind of protecting you, you know, in terms of insulating you from the rush. And then I think you get later in the game and you're in all these third and tens. Like I, to me, that's maybe the most glaring issue is right. just being in third and 10 a lot is just bad process. Like you need to be more efficient on set first and second down. And I know For that's kind of like second down the, uh, and, and first down in a lot of cases too. Right. And some of that's Carson being unsettled. Some of that's Carson rushing his process. He missed some throws. Some of it's play calling, whatever it is, right. It, it, it's multifactorial. It's not one thing, but you cannot, you cannot, cannot, cannot be in third and 10 as much as they were in this game and expect to come out of this with a clean sheet. Like if you look around the league, third and 10, like I coach pass rushers in the off season, a lot kind of surprisingly given my offensive background and one of the things i'm like if you have any inclination that it's pass down in distance some type of tell offensively rush the passer because that's how you get paid and that's these guys know that too right so third and ten they can set up moves they can stack moves there's multiple rush opportunities so i think that's that's a huge factor but it's play calling it's tendencies it's carson holding the ball too long i, I think a lot of people want to absolve him but there's certain times where you just gotta get the ball out of your hand right. you know like just get the ball out of your hand. Every single time. That's not all nine sacks, but I'm sure there's three or four in there where I'm like, man, just get the ball out. Even if it's incomplete, just get the ball out. Help the guys out. And then I think Scott Turner, just understanding third and ten, you can't expect to get the ten yards every single time. So change your approach, change your philosophy to insulate that group, especially when they're struggling early. Like you can't just I, – I, I think back to this game against Seattle and Green Bay where Seattle had eight sacks in the first half, and then Green Bay comes out and basically runs the ball down their throat for the last two quarters of the game and wins the football game. Like you got to kind of read the game as well too. I think there's an element of that for sure. And and that's, that's, um, cause that's something that's come up when I re re reading my mentions on Twitter and, you know, doing other stuff, you know, asking for questions from, from listeners, like situational awareness by the play caller yeah. where, you know, is that as simple as, you know, and you, you just brought up a couple of examples, you know, has that been, I don't want to say an issue, but is that something well, maybe it has it been an issue and is it something how do you resolve it how do you get to that sooner and, and develop that well it's tough man like i think i think when you're when you're a play caller you know i coach high school football you've coached you've coached high school sports or whatever there's there's an element of like if this was done correctly this is a touchdown and that shows up in the film right if this yeah. is blocked correctly right. if the routes run correctly all those things so there's always that element of you as a play caller that it's like the scheme is is there it's supported um it's it should be if executed correctly it's there right but i think you also have to understand that like you need to sometimes push to get your guys in better situations so they don't have to win in these demonstrative ways like what can you do that that's my biggest 
kind of thought about the offense right now is Scott Turner is this offensive staff. Are they doing everything they can to put the players, the pass protectors, um, you know, the, um, the, the receivers, are they putting them in the best situation to win consistently? And, you know, I look around the league at some of the better offenses and the answer doesn't feel like, yes, like I watched Detroit even and like just the, the lengths they go to, to scheme up Amon Ross St. Brown and find him good windows and find him good opportunities. Cooper cup. Like you have talented guys here. Like, like I know they use a lot of pre-snap motion here, but use pre-snap motion on passing downs to challenge guys' coverage philosophies, right? I don't see a lot of bunches here on passing downs. They run their concepts from kind of spread out formations. That's fine. That's what this offense has been for 20 years, you know, even when uh, when his dad, Norv, was running the offense. But I do think there there should be an – that that's my one criticism. I think the scheme's fine. I would just see, are you pushing yourself – as hard as you can to put guys in the best position to be successful. I don't know. I haven't talked to Scott. You know, he's very kind of hard to get in terms of talking to, but that would be my one question I'd ask him immediately. Are you doing everything you can to put the, put these guys pass protection backs um, skill guys in the best position to, to win consistently. And I don't know. I don't know if that, I don't know if that answer is definitively yes, based on the first three games of the season. Right. And you know, part of it too is, and you brought up like what green Bay did against Seattle, for example, and my, the run game, you know, the other day, now they'll run it out of the jet. They'll run, you know, different, different guys and all that. But they, in the other day, they started to run it. Okay. And there's third series on for a couple of series. They did run it, but they still couldn't convert. That was a frustrating thing. But would you like to see them do a little bit like, and I wrote a story for ESPN.com about like them still looking for their offensive identity. And I went back to last year, and I know it's a different team, different skill, talent, and all that. So I don't want to say it's an apples-to-apples apples comparison. But when they started to win that four-game streak, they went back to a more of a power run game, right? Mm -hmm. And it seemed to settle them a little bit and take some of the pressure off Taylor Heineke, et cetera. Not saying you have to follow the exact same formula, but could they do that a little bit more? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, that's that's a really good point. I mean, I think when you look at their success last year, yeah, it came a lot around running the football. And I would just say, like, from an analytics perspective, and football is more than analytics, but just right. from a statistics perspective, going on a 19-play drive is not sustainable offense, right? It's not a viable solution long-term. And so I do think that they maybe need to find ways to limit the decision-making of Carson Wentz. And that's not an indictment of Carson Wentz, but it's hard. It's hard when you got to make – 50 decisions in a game and that's RPOs that's past concepts that's feeling a rush are there ways you can limit that stuff are there ways like you know one of the things Kyle always used to do that I had a lot of respect for is he was like I want to limit the amount of pure drop back passes to under 15 a game you know that that always doesn't happen but that was that was his goal keepers play pass running the football screens draws and not only is that good for the offensive line but that's also good for the quarterback because when you have a rollout on a keeper, it's just it's a simple high-low read. It's yes to the flat. If it's not there, look at the crossing route, hit the crossing route, right? Or run the football. And I think elements of that, I think I would like to see more of, especially given the slow starts, right? One of the things I think coordinators need to consider is that a quarterback is a human being, right? They're not a robot. They're not a CPU. You can't just be like, hey, hit your progressions and we'll score touchdowns. It's like, I got to get him settled in. I got to get him feeling comfortable. And in my opinion, one of the worst ways to do that is just hitting straight drop back passes in the beginning of the game, because you invite pressure. Carson likes to hold the football. You can tell he's not settled in. Are there other tools in my toolbox that would help me get him settled, help the offense get settled? And that's something that I think needs to be looked at. And that's what I'm saying. Are you doing what everything you can to put Carson and put this offense in the best possible position to be successful? And I come from a very different offensive background than him with the Kyle Shanahan West coast tree. And so to me, the solutions are keepers, quick game screens, run game, right? That's what the solutions are in this offense. It's not quite that way, right? Because the run game sets up everything in the West coast offense and Kyle's offense here. They'd like deep shots to set up the intermediate and right. short stuff. So it's different, right? And what are your solutions in the context of this offense to help with those decision-making processes? And I don't know if I'm familiar enough with the offense, but my, my default is to say get to some of those other tools and see if that helps out. Right. And, and, and to make it clear, like, I don't think 19 play drives are sustainable. Right. right? And I, cause it, like, these guys have playmakers. So it's not even about going to that same formula. It's about, can you, you know, is it better to use a little bit more of that earlier to, and I, and I think Brian Robinson will help. Although I think Gibson yeah. had a nice game the other day. 
So it's really about getting that and setting up the playmakers. And then, and then also going, and, and I talked to you about this the other day, so I want to address this. With the play action, and you brought up tendencies, and people are going to look at that. And I also know it's about marrying concepts. You know, the pass yeah. has to look like the run. It's not as, it doesn't seem to be as much about, hey, we're running the ball well, let's go do this. It's really about the concepts, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think so, and and I know you're you're I know you're not advocating for 19 play drives. Right, no one's right, advocating right. for that. That's but Chris Russell. Think... Shout out, Chris Russell. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I I do agree. Like you know, running the football, I, even in this last game, like I think even if they would run the football probably five more times in that first half, that's probably they probably convert a little bit more. Or they probably settle in. They bleed the clock a little bit. They don't give Philly an opportunity to kind of have that two minute drive at the end of the game. But yeah, so I think that's the thing is when. When this offense, at least week one against Jacksonville, was the most effective, they were spread out. They're doing the RPO stuff. They're trying to be kind of some version of Philadelphia, like just to give you like a one-to-one. Like Philadelphia was a power running team last year. They've stepped back and they say, we've got playmakers. Let's use them. Let's let our offensive line win one-on-ones. And let's let Jalen Hurst facilitate. And I think that's what they like want to be. They want to run RPOs. They want to run zone read kind of variations to hold the backside player out of the gun, get your best players on the field. I think that's kind of where they're headed. But that's not always the best way to run the football. That's not always the best way to do a play pass because if you're in that, you don't get a strong backfield action off the play pass, right? That's why people like bringing tight ends and fullbacks in, not necessarily because you have to run the football out of there, but because it forces guys to fit runs. It forces, like when a fullback comes downhill at you, I have to step up to hit him in the face. And when I step up to hit him in the face, there's a big void behind me, right? Right. Like that, that's a tool. It's a tool in the toolbox, using your personnel, using different run styles and philosophies to get a certain response by the defense. So yeah, when you say the concepts got to marry, I think that's hundred percent right. When was the last time they ran a run? And this is, I don't know, is when they had two tight ends to the left, like in a bun, in like in that wing look, they don't run the football out of that. They just don't do it. And I don't know why that is, but that becomes a huge tell, right? They like to motion to that. And to run the football, they like to motion to a balanced look. They run the football out of that. But when it's two guys stationary and two slot receivers and two receivers away in the slot, they don't run the football out of that that much. So to me, why not? Just run the football. It's okay. Run like a Wanda. Who cares? It's a three-yard gain. At least you break tendencies a little bit more by doing that. And so I think that's where I would say like of a marriage. Like you can't just have your pass games out of gun. And you're all the, and then you're, when you're under center, it's a play, you know, like it just doesn't work that way. I know you need both in the offense, but you need to make sure that they kind of mesh so that the defense doesn't get this, this, these big tells on your offense. And I'm not saying that's happening, but I do feel like there's a predictable element to this offense at times. But you know, it's funny because you brought up the play earlier. The Eagles got that sack against a seven man protection. They only rushed four, and it was exactly what you said. And it was a play action. You had two tight ends to the left. Brandon Graham is over them. And he steps up, drops back, two tight ends are blocking nobody. You have like three one-on-ones on the other side. Right. And they lost those. So that that's kind of what you're what you're talking about there. So you're facing Dallas this week. What do you do? You got my I mean, this is it's not just Micah Parsons. I mean, Lawrence is a really good pass rusher still. Lawrence is good. They've got some depth. Yeah, man. They they've do. got some guys. Armstrong had a couple sacks last week. I will say that I think. Lawrence's matchup with Evan Neal. Evan Neal is going to be a good football player at some point, but he's not there yet. Right. And so I think when you get a guy like Lawrence on a young player who's very, very green, it's that's that's going to be the result. So I think that's important for fans to understand. I think um, I, I really think the main thing, the most important thing, is staying efficient on first and second downs. Stay as efficient as you possibly can, because even in third and three situations everything kind of calms down for for Dallas, right? They do some exotic stuff. They run really good line stunts. They run these excellent pressure packages with picks for the linebackers, specifically Micah Parsons. They do creative stuff, and that kind of is prevalent throughout every down and distance. But you simplify what they do in terms of pressure when you're in third and three or when you're in third and one because they can't cover the back end the same way in that down and distance, right? So I think that, again, I don't know exactly how to do it. I would say you know, really look at the run scheme. They, they are very specific in terms of how they line up. And uh, when you line up in 11 personnel, they line up in an over front if they're playing four down and they line up in a jam front essentially, like which is the three guys inside covered up. That's the two variations of front. So out of, um, out of 11 personnel. So I would use that kind of 
you know, specific approach in that personnel grouping and see if we can have some runs that take advantage of that kind of deliberately lining up. So again, like you can find ways to normalize them, but can you take advantage of them? And can you put your guys in good positions to be successful? Those are the questions that as an OC, as a play caller, I think you need to be asking yourself, how do we normalize and dictate to the defense? And then how do we use that normalization to put our guys in the best position to be successful? And that's what, that's what needs to happen on first and second down, because you cannot, you cannot live in third and long against this team, against really any team in the NFL. Right. That's not like – that's just like unsound philosophy. Yeah, because it's not like the Eagles were dominating as a pass rushers in the first two games. So when you look at this line too, we saw the problems in the interior. You know, Wes Schweitzer, you know, for he's a veteran player, but he's only – that was his third game at center. So mm -hmm. there were some issues with snaps, some issues in protection, but the guards, Norwell and Turner, and Turner especially, struggled as well. What do you do there? What are the solutions here? Because they signed Nick Martin. You play with Nick Martin. Um, yeah. You have, I mean, you know, I, I think we had talked in the offseason about Cosme at guard if they had drafted a tackle. Right. I don't know that you can make that move now, but what, do you, what are your thoughts about possible personnel situations that could be done to help there? And, right. you know. Well, I think, I think there's, there is a school of thought where, you know, I've been a part of, of days like this where you give up a lot of pressures, you give a lot of sacks, and that's just a bad day at the office. You know, you have a bad day where you can't write, you know, you can't ask the right question, like all those yeah. types of things. Like I, I'm on camera and I can't speak. Like those days happen, right? Adam. Um, and I think there is a little bit of like, don't, don't burn the building down just yet. Right. You know, those guys are pros. They're professionals. Like, look at the defense. The defense, everyone was ready to fire Jack. Everyone says we should have cut all these players two weeks ago against Detroit. And they came out and they responded. And that's what professional football is, man. Like, it's about finding guys who are pros and can kind of say, I had a bad day. These are the things I'm going to do to improve it. Right. And I think, obviously, the coaching staff needs to support that. But I do think that those guys are going to be better this week. Even that starting group will be better. They're going to they're going to take that. And, and improve you know like you talk to guys around the building and he was just I got an offensive lineman he was like man that's a rough day at the office for everybody you know we'll get it we'll get it right and I think that's that's the right approach so even though like there's this this urge like we got to move it around we got to burn it down we got to break it apart like take a breath let's give him another week it's the first time you know they've really been all playing together because Chase is out this week so I think that's important Nick Martin reminds me a lot of Chase Rulier. Smart guy, not the best athlete in the whole world, but can get the protections called. Maybe you put him in, maybe you move west to guard. It seems like that the group that's out there right now has the best chemistry. I like from an, an athlete standpoint, moving Cosme to guard and then Lucas to tackle. I think that's a, I like that. That's just my approach. But I do think that that really puts you in a tough spot from a depth standpoint. Right. Like if there's any injury at tackle, like you just, I think that's the thing is you just don't have, there's no other person on the roster you feel comfortable playing a tackle, right? So if one of those guys gets hurt, like, what are you going to do? And, um, and so I think that's the thing about that that always makes me a little leery. Um, but, yeah, I, I think give Trey Turner another week. You know, he's coming off an injury. Like, let's see what happens. He's struggled, no doubt. But maybe another week, if you don't feel good about that, I'd move west to guard and Nick to center. That's what I would that, – that's my early thought because I think Norwell actually played okay. Yeah. And I think um, outside of the early pressure to sweat, Leno played fine. You know what I mean? So I think right. it's just – Kind of making, solid. Right. So making sure guys are comfortable. Cosme, I think, has a lot of upside. He had a rough day on Sunday, but I think he's a guy who's who's maturing. Like if you look at the pass rushers on the commanders, they're a very specific body type and none of them look like Brandon Graham. And so for the, if that's the first time you're seeing Brandon Graham in your career and getting used to that power and getting used to the weight that he has, because he's like 200, 290 pounds bullying on the edge. It's a different feel. And so I think that's just another data point for the CPU and he's going to grow and get better from that. Like that, that's, that's what it is. That's how you get better at offensive line. So I would expect that whole group to play a lot better this week. I think he matches up much better Cosme. I'm saying with a guy like Micah Parsons, where it's more finesse, where it's more athlete, because he's a tremendous athlete and Lawrence is a power rusher, but he's a taller power rusher. So it's going to play more into like what Montez brings every day in practice. So I don't think it's as, critical i think you need a plan protection plan for, for sure because those guys are good you don't want to be in a lot of drop back situations but i don't think you need to burn the building down just yet and you know with cosme and i don't want to stick on this too long because we're going to get kind of you know football geeky with it but when i'm watching him against some of the failed pass rushes and i try to slow it down so i'm seeing what leno's doing and how his feet work are and where his hands are and then i'm trying to compare to cosme to see what's the difference and i know like you're playing guys differently. Not it's not again, not apples to apples. Like just because Leno's doing it this way doesn't mean Cosby doing way this way against this particular player. 
I get it. But there are some times too, though, where that second step is a little bit flatter and then your hands are really wide. Is that, is that, I mean, am I seeing that right? That's how he sets. That's how he's always set. He kind of like, he, he basically, what he does, is he kind of gives a bait hand with his right hand. He's playing right tackle and kind of, and so when the guy throws his move, he, move, he kind of drops it down and loops it back up to the chest. And it works really well against people that you're stronger than, right? Because okay. what you do is you loop that hand up, you get on the chest, you take your inside hand, you punch the inside hip. And because he's got such good feet, he can widen the pocket that way. Okay. But when he goes up against a power rusher like Trayvon Walker or Brandon Graham, somebody who's he's very those guys are very i've played against brandon graham he is extremely strong I like him. he's extremely strong so that move to widen you'll be able to widen him but it's gonna be late you know what i mean you're gonna get pushed back and it's gonna be late so i think understanding like that's one thing when you watch leno like he's not the best left tackle in the whole world but he understands who he's blocking really yes, well he, he understands smart. how to set them he understands what kind of tricks to pull out like does he kick two and then kind of flatten his set out to lock him down those are things that you love about Leno's game. And that's something Cosby needs to grow into, right? He needs to understand learning from Leno. You know, I've talked to Morgan Moses about Cosby in the off season and just the, the rawness of him, you know what I mean? And like, he's a good player. He's fine. But like to play elite tackle in the NFL, you need a bag of tricks and he's still working on it. Right. Yeah, it's like hard. We just talked to, we just talked about his set, right. That works against James Smith Williams, Casey two Hill, even Montez sweat, because he's, because because sweat's taller than him so it works really well but against a power rusher it's going to be less effective so what's the new trick now to stop that power rusher and i think he'll figure it out because like you said he's a smart guy and all tackles go through that trent williams went through that it's just that yeah. he was so athletic that you would see sometimes you're like god that looked horrible and yet he would he would win but and right. he would admit that he told he would say that and there were a couple times for cosby where and i think there were two in particular where he got a late jump and i'm wondering like is that a crowd noise thing? Because yeah. everybody gets off the ball and he didn't, he gave up one pressure or a sack that way. It was like, it was just because you see the snap of the ball, everybody's moving and he's not. So that was nothing, but let's the last one on offense, Brian Robinson, how much when he comes back and we still don't know, you know, he's looking good. I think they feel very optimistic, but we don't know exactly when he's coming back. How much, you know, is that, what can, how can he be, his return be viewed? I mean, Again, not like Gibson. I, I thought Gibson ran the ball pretty well the other day outside of one run. Yeah, I think I think I, I totally agree with that assessment of Gibson. And so I do think Gibson's playing well. But what I do think it does is it is it there's narratives, right? There's narratives about players, right? And Gibson is like this, you know, like he's an inconsistent runner. He, you know, his vision's inconsistent. And Brian Robinson's narrative, and rightfully slow, so is like the opposite of that. He's not this explosive play guy, but his vision's great. He's going to elevate the offensive line. He's going to keep us on schedule. And I think just those two narratives on the players is going to encourage Scott to maybe lean into the running game just a touch more. Yeah, and that's and what I, I think. That, yeah, and I think that is something, you know, we talked about that. And I think that that's something that I would just, I, I would expect to see. I think they're just more comfortable with Brian Robinson, you know, having 25 touches in the run game as opposed to Gibson. Like Gibson will still get touches, but it'll be different. And I think that's something that um, – that's the advantage of having a batic is the confidence that it breeds in the coaching staff. I don't think there's that big of a discrepancy in terms of player at the moment, but they're much more confident in him in those situations. That's, so let's look at the defense for a few minutes. And so, you know, it's funny It's I'm, it's funny to say that I thought they played a lot better because, yeah. you know, you still gave up big plays, but those big plays, they were in position to defend them. And I don't know how many teams make those plays in those situations – Devontae Smith was awesome, you know, and I know like with Kendall Fuller, maybe, you know, can he finish those plays? That's the question I have. And maybe that's not him, but you force them to make a great play. So, but they look like they were assignment um, smarter, I guess. Yeah. Is what do you see that they can build on? And did what you see is that it is, was that something they can build on? Yeah. I mean, I think, I was very, very pleased with the defense. Like, you know, go, you go to PFF, and I think everybody grades in the green or the blue, which is a very positive grade. Outside of, like, Kendall Fuller, John Ridgeway, who's been here, like, two days, and then um, the new nickel nickel player. I forgot his name. Wild, Wild Goose. Goose. yeah. You know, and th that makes sense when you look at the game. 
Uh, and I think like, I think the thing that I, that I take away is guys are playing fast and physical, right? They came out with an energy and a motivation early on in the game against Philadelphia, a very talented football team. There weren't, there was maybe one coverage bust, I think on the past the tight end, mm -hmm. that was kind of that big play. But outside of that, there's tight coverage. Guys are playing confident on the outside. That's a big deal. You know, the linebackers doing a great job. Defensive line's doing great. I thought John had an excellent game. Paid had an excellent game. Uh, you know, got some good production at FA Albada. I think you got a nice, you know, for a late find, a guy in Ridgeway who's going to contribute a little bit. You know, like he's he's raw, he's green, he's got a lot of growing to do, but at least he's a guy that you feel like could kind of flush out that group and spell those guys some snaps. So um, I think it's great. I think they did an excellent job. And people say, oh, well, what are you talking about? But it's like they scored 24 points and they held them out and they shut them out in the second half. And like it's, it's not like they pulled the brake off, their foot off the gas. Like they were still taking shots. Deep. Yeah, in the third so. quarter. So I do think that um, they played well. And if they can continue to do this, like they should win some football games if the offense can come around. You know, it's funny. Right. Like, I think we were talking about this like – Weeks ago. Yeah, it's like reversed, right? It's completely like the narrative. Like the offense is looking really inept. And the defense now is like the reason that they're in games, which is kind of crazy to think about. It is. And and I also think like at least, at least on defense you've got – you know, I know nobody wants to hear about youth as an excuse and you can still play well if you're young. So I'm not saying that, but like you would expect young guys to keep building on performances. Right. Jamin Davis, you know, Derek for, you know, Forrest, um, Benjamin St. Juice. So you would expect those guys to keep building and getting better. Now, will that make the defense better? Well, it should. How good? I don't know. Right. Um, but like, that's the other part of it too. If you're looking, whereas offensively, we just talked about the offensive line it's a it's to me it's a bit of a situation that i'm not right. sure you don't resolve it with young guys in the roster right now because chris paul is not at that point you blah 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 but at least defensively you have that as a reason and then you get chase young back right. maybe as soon as next week so i think there's at least reasons where you say well they can build on some things here but how much of what they did sunday is transferable to the dallas game as far as the success they had and what dallas does versus what philly did yeah, so I think it's funny, like Dallas is a different animal, you know, right. it's much more akin to Detroit. And we've seen how they've struggled against teams like Detroit, like the um, that are kind of a run first approach, but in a very traditional way, like, they're going to have a fullback out there, they're going to have multiple tight ends, they're going to go on balance, they're going to have extra offensive linemen in the game, I'm talking about Dallas now. And historically, this defense and this defensive line has not been able to physically match up very well with those types of runs and you know like I think we've talked about this before like Mike always used to say if you if you want to run the football it's got to be part of your identity it is 1000 percent right. of who Dallas wants to yeah. be they want to get Zeke between 15 and 25 touches they want Marcus they want Pollard to get you know 15 touches a game that's a lot of resources allocated to the run game the offensive line isn't the same group it's been Trey Smith at left tackle is a mismatch in passing situations. Right. He's a physical, athletic son of a gun, and he moves people off the spot. Zach Martin's probably the second best guard in the NFL. Like they do some good stuff up front. Their tight ends block well. They're going to demand that people fit runs. You know, safeties fit right. runs, corners fit runs, and you know, there's a run against uh, the Giants where the safety comes up to fit, and the guard just murders him, and it's a and it's a huge gain. So. I think um, I think that's something that this team has not shown a tremendous proclivity to is stopping the run in those situations. So are they going to sell out for it? Are they going to, you know, allocate more recess resources to it in terms of body count in the box? I would say yes, but the thing is, they do they are a good play action team. They do have some weapons on the outside that can hurt you. So you know, C.D. Lamb very productive. Gallup is coming coming back, and they do take shot plays down the field. Like they should have killed New York. Like C.D. Lamb drops a wide open kind of post. I think it was like a high cross maybe. And you know, they had two penalties in the red zone that kind of stymied drives. Like they are a they're more polished than I thought. And I think they do a good job of insulating Cooper Rush through the run game. So like, can you just say, hey, first and second down, you're getting zero here. And let's get Cooper Rush in some long down and distance situations, which he hasn't been in a ton of, no. and force him to beat you from the pocket. And you know why does this team then struggle? Because if they if there's a cons if they struggle against Detroit for this, like what can they learn from that game to to apply to here? And why has it been? Why have they struggled against this that kind of look? 
Well, I think one of the reasons is they go, they tend to go Cinco versus these um, kind of run heavy teams. And they don't, they don't rep Cinco like as much as they do their base defense. And when you're in Cinco, your fits change, right? And also like when you don't have the personnel to run Cinco, like I'm not, I'm going to pick on FA Obata. He had a great game against Philly, he played solid against Detroit. But when you got him playing four I, like people are going to eat him up in the run game. Like he's 260, 265. And like, People in tell in people what the single package is too. Yeah, so the thing goes single package is basically five defensive linemen. So you're adding like body weight out there. You're, right. You know, you're playing a nose guard. You're playing maybe a four eye or a three technique. So shoulders of the guards, and you get edge players. So it ends up looking like a three four basically. Right. Um, and and the thing is like the run fits change. Yeah. How you beat double double teams change, and you can tell guys aren't always the most comfortable in that situation. I do think in addition. Like, not that John Ridgeway is like, you know, the second coming of Vince Wolfork or anything like that, but having a body, <clears throat> having a body like that just to play nose and let John and, uh, and Payne play the three techniques, that, that in and of itself will help. Like, just yeah. getting a bigger body out there. But um, I do think like they just have a hard time. And, and that fact that that's like their default response when sometimes they actually play the runs better in their base defense, like they right. play the runs against Philly predominantly from base defense and they did a great job and i think because they know how to fit versus those looks so that's something maybe if i'm jack i'm gonna do a little self-scout reevaluate say maybe we do better versus these looks and with this personnel on the field and also like stopping the run like you know it's tough like when in in the detroit game for example like they match nickel to 13 personnel three tight ends which is not uncommon but you get players in that nickel who aren't used to fitting runs all the time so that's another thing that you need to think about is how do you want to kind of allocate resources on first and second down to stop the run? And what, who do you want? What is your identity on first and second down? And that, that, yeah. And that's, that's the last thing. And then very, very last thing quickly, where have you seen the biggest growth in Jamin Davis the last couple of weeks? Yeah, man. <clears throat> I think the thing is, he's just playing confident football, you know, to my eye. And I think that's something that, he was doing early on, but he was playing confidently and doing the wrong things sometimes, right. but he, at least he's playing fast. And I think for him, that's maybe the biggest improvement. And the thing that makes you the most excited is that he's playing fast to the football. And so last week, I thought he kind of eliminated some of the mental mistakes. He's playing physical. He's, he's right. He, you see the athleticism, you see the upside and all of a sudden it, it gets kind of exciting. If he can string a couple games together, like you're talking about him in a completely different way. And you're yeah. talking about what he does for the defense in a completely different way. Yep. And I, you know, I like, that's been my big thing is what he's showing against the run. Cause I thought he was really good against the run at times last week, blew up a play at the goal line on the zone read that Cam yeah. Crow gets a tackle on a couple other times. I saw him shutting a block and going to make the play. So it's, you know, there's something that's where you, what you want to see is the growth and you start, mm -hmm. you know, last week, last week in a game and a half, I'd say we've seen growth. Yeah. Keep, you know, now the key is stack it together stack one on top of the other anyway logan you're the best tell people where they can follow you tell them about your podcast with craig hoffman yeah so i got the take command podcast which you can find wherever you get your podcasts check out that information about the yeah, sacks really that, was a long, that was a long episode and then instagram logan underscore paulson 82 and obviously i do the take command show with julie there's an instagram or there's a youtube page all of our stuff's on there uh so check that out and uh, give us a like if you like that kind of content so and, and just so people know, like you had something up, I think it was yesterday, you and Santana going over some defensive plays that was really informative. And so, again, check that out on, on Instagram and it is always good stuff. Logan, you're the best. Thank you very much. John, thanks so much, man. Always a pleasure. To always illuminating talking to you, man. Very good. Thank you, man. That's it for this episode. Thanks to Logan for joining me. Thank you, as always, for listening again, folks. I know it's hard right now, so hang in there. I will be back on Friday when I'm going to have a preview of the Cowboys as well as my predictions and keys to the game. I'm combining it all into one, one big happy podcast. So I'll be, I'll be back with that one on Friday afternoon, and I'll talk to you next time.